Hi, I'm Ethan Wong. Today, I'm here speaking with Patrick Phillips. Hi, Ethan. Um, okay, so should I just begin by, sorry, I didn't do great on that. Begin by just talking about my who I am and why I'm here. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, my name is Patrick Phillips. Um, I'm a writer and uh, I write poetry and nonfiction. Um, and I'm the author of three books of poems um, and one that's coming out um, in a year um, called Song of the Closing Doors. And um, yeah, I'm here to talk with Ethan about poetry and, and um, you know, what it's like to devote one's life to this. All right, we'll get straight into the question. And one of the first ones is, what is special about poetry? And I think this is especially apt question to ask you since I think you made it clear you write nonfiction too, right? And I've always thought that there is something special about poetry, but I think everyone has a different way to say it. And it's kind of difficult to put in words. Yeah, you know, I, I, um, I th I've always been drawn to poetry, I guess, as a place for things to be made visible that are often invisible, things to be said that are off that often go unsaid. Um, I remember being a teenager. Um, I grew up in a small town in Georgia, and I remember being a teenager and sort of there's that point in adolescence where you kind of realize that a lot of the adults around you are holding out a lot. They're withholding a lot about what's really going on under the surface and what's really happening in families and relationships and you know, with one's past and all the things that people don't tell you. And I guess I, I got really interested when I discovered that there were poets um, I started reading who seemed to be talking about all that stuff, like all the secret code uh, of things that I never heard anyone in my family or in my town really talk about. And it, it felt like I had this kind of access suddenly to, to a kind of underground network of people who said the real stuff, you know, and that, that's kind of what I got hooked on as a reader of poetry when I was a teenager. And I guess that's what I still go to poems for a lot is to not necessarily answers to, to what my life is like, but um, company, you know, a kind of sense of, of not being alone and, and someone else out there having felt and, and articulated something that I feel but maybe I've never been able to put into words. Yeah, I think something really powerful about that is it feels almost as if uh, as, uh, as I mature, right, that a lot of, a big part of that is learning to leave things unsaid, like you said, right, like you mentioned, trying to keep it, everything important in subtext as opposed to just straight up saying it. So I wanted to ask, because I feel like part of it also shows in poetry as I'm like writing poetry. So how do you kind of deal with that if you're trying to say what is unsaid, but at the same time, you have to deal with that kind of same idea when you're writing it? Yeah, that's a really good point. It is a really good point because my favorite, um, my favorite writers are often writers who leave a kind of gap between what's overtly said and what's understood, where, where some of what I'm getting is, is uh, information that I bring to the poem, not necessarily, it's not all on the page that there's a gap between um, the emotion in the poem or the ideas in the poem and what's overtly stated. So I agree, it's a real paradox, that one. Um, and yeah, the poem that hits you right over the head with it is, is usually the kind of crappy poem, you know, like the ones that I tend to like. Um, it, it always feels to me like a, like, like a, you know, when you, if you've ever like been somewhere in public when you have a very close friend who's also in the room in a, in a crowd, it's in a party or something. It's like that moment when the two of you are far across the room and you kind of, you lock eyes with each other, you know, and, and you can just kind of nod or something. And there's like a great deal is understood without anything being said. And I, I love that feeling with a, with a close friend. And I guess one of the wonders of poetry for me is I've sometimes had that feeling reading the words of people who are long dead or who, you know, live in totally different worlds than I do. But, but there's some kind of connection that is somewhat what's been said, but also part of what you kind of just both understand, you know? So yeah, I, I don't have a good answer to that, but it is a paradox that poetry is both about what's said and then about the white space and the silences. I mean, one of my goals is to always create a, a, a poem in which there's a kind of eloquent silence in which parts of the silence is like a rest in music. You know, it's not meaningless, a rest in music. It's not, it's, you can't take them out. It, you know, the whole expression of the thing depends not just on the notes that are played, but on those pauses and the time that passes in between. 
Yeah. I mean, that's really got me thinking now because it's definitely so much of what is almost difficult for me to discern between what you could like classify as a good poem and a bad poem kind of rests in what you're talking about. It's like the subtleties of even saying something, not saying something of like just leaving enough out because there's like this, the problem with the blank space is that it is so, because of its nature, open to interpretation that it's really, that's the subjective part. And then that's what really gets, either like hooks you or it doesn't. I'm not exactly. sure. Exactly. Well, and I, I think some of it hinges on, you know, one, I don't know if you know The Onion, the, the sort of satiric website, The Onion. Yeah. And one, of my, one of my favorite headlines that I've always had on my office door, you know, says, from The Onion says, local poet takes extra five minutes to weird up poem, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think that's really funny because like, you know, it, it, it's, it's a kind of like, there's the thing of being strange and cryptic and leaving things out as, as the, the Onion's joking about there of like taking a little, take a little time to weird up your poem. But, but that's not actually what I'm talking about. The alternative to that is the poem that actually gets into terrain, whether it's emotional or political or whatever, that's so complex that it can't really be boiled down. Into, so that in other words, that some of what's being left out is not said because it's unsayable. And, and so you, you try to get the reader as close as you can to an ineffable emotion. Because um, the, poem, the poem that's about emotions that we have names for, uh, you know, if a poem is simply happy or simply sad, like that's not as interesting to me. I mean, most of the, most of the, most of the experiences that I end up writing about are somewhat enigmatic to me. Like I don't fully understand them and I can't, I can't summarize them and thus the need for the poem. You know, if I could, I probably wouldn't need to write about them. Yeah, I think a lot of it's been the same way for me. Like whenever I write, it's because it's something that it's, because you could just talk to someone about it. You could, if you're just sad because something bad happened in your day, you could just tell a loved one. You'd be like, oh, my day was kind of bad. And here's why, yeah. right? I told my cat, you know, he understands yeah. everything. <laughs> yeah, th right? But it's like when you write a poem, it's not, you're not necessarily trying to just say, oh yeah, my day was bad. Here's why. You're, you're, there's something out there where it's difficult for you to even say to begin with. So then you need to like, just do whatever else you can about it, I guess. Yeah, and I guess it it is a very hopeful act to, to write a poem. Like even if you don't, ever publish it or uh it never finds an audience or anything like it it is hopeful in that it's you wouldn't do it if you didn't think there was some possibility of someone out there understanding something right i mean i don't i, I suppose there are poets who don't seek that who don't, there are poets who aren't after being understood but I, for me anyway i i am i'm looking i i think writing a poem for me is always a hope that it's not just me, whatever it is, there's something in that experience. And, you know, I write a lot about family. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons I think is it's, it's something that connects us, everybody, you know, a poem about, uh, you know, a poem about a, I, I had a, a crazy brother who's kind of wild as a teenager, like a poem about my crazy brother, a lot of people have met someone like that, or a poem about a kind of scary moment with one's father, or, you know, a, a, a beloved sibling, like, I don't know, there's, a, there's just a lot that people can connect with. And we're in a moment where it's very hard to think of universals, but, you know, family struggle, family drama, the complexities of loving flawed human beings who one's related to, like, this strikes me as like one of our enduring universals. So, yeah, I, I do think, I do think that's a kind of, yeah, one is hoping somebody out there would get it, right, would, would feel some connection. Yeah. And I think a point you kind of already implicitly explored, which is that there is always that element of specificity to it. Like we, uh, I think it's important that we write about these broad topics, but in like small strokes, because that's like where the connection is. And that's where the, uh, that's where you can have all of that blank space where you can have all those subtleties. Otherwise you are just kind of very broadly like gesturing at something. Yeah, and you don't feel anything with that, right? I mean, I, when I teach, I teach writing workshops and I teach a lot of people who are taking a writing workshop for the first time. And one of the, one of the discoveries that people tend to make is that 
I mean, it just takes them a long time to believe the thing we're interested in is your actual you, like your own life, your own relation, like the specifics. The poet William Carlos Williams said, um, the local is the only true road to the universal. And, and it's a paradox that like the, the thing that makes that really hits you in the gut and someone else's poem is often this crazy specific thing that's incredibly particular to their own life. But that's what I feel not when they talk in generalities or, you know, kind of greeting card um, triteness. So yeah, it is, it is really paradoxical, but that's how we connect with other people is, is the more particular they are to their own experience in their own life. And that, that's what I see people learning a lot in a workshop is just a, a overcoming that voice in your head that says nobody cares nobody yeah. gives a crap about my life why should i write about what happened to me you know who cares or that you have to have some I, when i was a teenager i read a lot of like the world war one poets like wilfred owen and Siegfried sassoon i remember thinking oh if only i had you know fought in the trenches you know in 1918 <laughs> then i could be a poet you know <laughs> like an idea that you have to have had some particular experience but you know everyone has had a childhood and that's sort of you know that's material enough yeah and kind of building off of that which is i think you already kind of mentioned this little and when you were discussing what you write about mm -hmm. what kind of things like inspire you like try to like can you try to identify the specific points you think of like a day or specific traits of the world which might inspire a poem I mean, to be honest, like what inspires me is sound. Like I, I got into poetry because I love the sound of words. I love, I mean, my first favorite poet was, was um, Gerard Manley Hopkins, you know, who, who, you know, wrote these incredible sounding poems and, you know, they, they're, he was religious. So they're kind of Christian poems, which I didn't share that, but, you know, glory be to God for dappled things, for skies of coupled colors, a brinded cow, for rose mole all in stipple upon trout that swim, fresh fire coal chestnuts, you know, like I, I remember, I memorized that when I was like 16 years old, because I love the sound of it. I just, I just loved the sound of the words. I love the rhythm of the language. Um, I love the, the wildness of the vocabulary. And that's still true for me. I, I don't really start poems with ideas. I tend to start them with snippets of language um, or I hear somebody say something, you know, and a, a particular turn of phrase. And, you know, I just, you know, it catches in my ear and I like think about it. And then I realize, okay, there's something in there. Like, why am I so, why am I thrilled at that particular combination of words? Or, an I, or a sentence comes into my head and I wake up in the night and scribble it down. And then usually the poem grows out of that. Um, and I try to figure out then why it's stuck and hooked into me. Like, what was it? Um, and that sometimes leads to elaborating the poem, but usually the inspiration for me just comes with like the sound of the thing. Um, and I'll often, I'll often try to find a formal requirement that makes me kind of solve a puzzle. I like writing poems that have some kind of form, not always like traditional forms, but some kind of formal requirement. And I, I kind of get myself in a straight jacket and I have to find a way out, you know, a, a complicated form. Um, and all of those for me are just ways of actually not directing the poem too much, like creating some element of chance where the poem starts to go in directions that are a little bit beyond my control. Um, Cause that's where the interesting, for me, usually that's where the interesting territory lies is not in the thing that I think I'm writing about, but the thing that the poem kind of wants to be about. Oh yeah, yeah. I know that sounds a little bit mystical and I'm not like a mystical person, but there's a point, it's related to improvisation and music, you know, like there's a point where a, a musician who's improvising, uh, you know, inspiration comes because they're just lost in it. And it's, you know, it, it, by being in trouble and getting in trouble, you know, you come up with some new innovation um, to solve the problem of having to do something on the fly. Yeah. I definitely agree with that, especially some of the stuff you said about like finding snippets and like because of phrases. I think something so funny to me is that uh, a big part of it is people just in normal everyday conversation come up with really unique ways to say certain things without Absolutely. even like intending to do so. And like yes. you're, you sit there, you listen to that and you're like, that's amazing. That is incredible. I like need to write that down. Yeah, but I think just a huge part of it is just like the way 
the word sound either out loud or in your head and then for me I've always been like like sometimes I'll like walk I'll think of something like as a line and I'll just be like repeating it to myself over and over again until I can get home and like write it down so yeah, it's just up all about absolutely. that kind of stuff yeah me too and there, there is a kind of poetry in everyday speech you know there's a, there's a there's a poetic sound to it sometimes people are even tapping into what meter does like when I'm looking at billboards and advertising I'm always sort of scanning them in my head and realizing like the ad person whether knowingly or not has like written an iambic pattern that has a kind of pleasing effect on our ears you know and and yeah and there's also just like the outrageousness like a lot of times when I'm laughing and joking around with my friends like you know they'll come up with some crazy metaphor that's super apt and that's like part of what we're laughing about so I, you know I do think there's a lot less distance between the kind of poetry I want to write and this is not true of all poets but there's a lot less distance between the kind of poetry I write and everyday speech you know that then people tend to think people are put off by poetry sometimes but you know the stuff that I love is often tapping into some of that same way we just revel in language you know talking with a beloved friend or laughing or you know I don't know having an amazing conversation like I love I love um I love the playfulness of, of the way people speak and often I think people associate poetry with a much more rigid kind of whiff of the library you know a sort of fancy version but I, I as much as possible I love to try to keep it keep it at the human level and down on the ground you know yeah that's great uh if you're ready we I think we can go into a poem about it okay so I I um I was I thought I'd read a new poem um I'm working on finishing a manuscript right now so um yeah which one should I read Um, okay, so this is this is uh, this isn't too long. This is a a poem about a uh, a guy I went to high school with. Uh, it's called "Run It Back." It's also about New York City. Um, my book has a lot of the new book has a lot of poems about New York because um, I've lived here for now for twenty years. Um, this is called "Run It Back." Though he's been dead for thirty years, Lou Langton's Lou. Sorry, let me start again. "Run It Back." Though he's been dead for thirty years. Lou Langston's voice comes back to me. Every time I stop and stare at that caged in court on West 4th Street, where tonight the dudes are talking shit at this little guard who slaps his chest and says, my bad, my bad, just like Lou did, with a little tap upside the head whenever he'd drop a pass or miss a three or lose the cutter coming off the screen. So that for an instant through the crowd, I see my friend again at 17 still unravaged by the chemo and the wheelchair and the shunt as he struts out past some losing team calling next got next who wants to run in that year when all we ever did was play as old men laced their fingers through the fence staring like they knew someday i'd be standing here thinking this thank you that was great and I well, definitely... thank, yeah i'm happy to do it I could definitely like hear what you were talking about, about your poetry and everything, just through that one poem, so. Oh, that's great, that's great, I'm glad. Well, it's a pleasure to, it's a pleasure to, to talk with you and to read it. Yeah, do you wanna like have any closing remarks before we close out? Um, no, you know, I, well, okay, I said no and then I'm going to. Um, I guess um, as far as closing remarks, I'd say, you know, I do think we're in an amazing moment for poetry right now, I think, you know, it's it's exploded in popularity in the last 20 years since I've been writing. And, um, you know, a lot of poets who are really um, just transforming what American poetry has been, people who are writing about um, political upheavals and race in America and, you know, immigrant experience. And just, I, I feel like it's an amazing moment right now for poetry. And I think it's it's thrilling at times for me to see how, I think maybe the internet is responsible for this, but just how much um, poetry has become has gone from the margins, kind of more into the middle of things for a lot of people. For your generation, it seems like. So you know, I find all that really thrilling, and I you know I hope people who are reading who are who are watching this and tapping into what all you're doing are you know out there just discovering and reading new people because there's a lot of amazing a lot of amazing work being done right now. You know. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Great. Ethan.